In the 7th and 8th century CE, medieval adherents of the Hindu god Vishnu intervened in the geopolitical entanglements of Kashmir with the mighty Chinese, Tibetans, and Arabs. They did so through the composition of a sprawling text, the Vishnu Dharmottara Purana, whose ideas came to be expressed through conquest, both within and outside India, by the famous Kashmiri king Lalita Aditya Muktapida, who we talked about here. The word Purana might conjure up the image of an eternal, unchanging Hinduism. To us in the 21st century, Puranas seem to be distant, timeless collections of religious stories. But as we will see, at the time of their composition, Puranas were profoundly political texts and had absolutely brilliant and audacious ambitions. I am Anirudh Kanisetti, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below, and remember that we are all figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. In the 6th century, the ancient culture of Gandhara, once the beating heart of an Indo-Iranic world that stretched from Mathura deep into Central Asia, was laid low for the last time. A tremendous earthquake shattered the networks once built by the Indo-Scythians, Kushans and Huns, and the region's centers of political gravity shifted to Afghanistan under the Kabul Shahs. All of this in videos here. Rising in this chaos was Kashmir, hitherto the frontier of the Indo-Iranic world. Its landscape, once dominated by Buddhists and Pashapata Shaivas, was on the verge of a significant change. Within a century after the collapse of Gandhara, around 650 CE, a new dynasty had consolidated power there. This family, the Karkota Nagas, would lay the foundations for nearly a half millennium of Kashmiri eminence. In the early 8th century, the Karkota's ambitions were growing and they expanded down to the plains. Here they tussled with the aforementioned Kabul Shahs, who were Buddhist and sometimes Hindu Turks. Soon after, a truly magnificent text made its appearance, the Vishnu Dharmottara Purana, studied by historian Ronald Inden in querying the medieval. Composed by adherents of Pancharatra or Five Nights Vaishnavism, the Vishnu Dharmottara focused on the worship of the four-faced Vaikuntha Vishnu, embodied in images and propitiated with verses and ablutions. The Pancharatras were originally forest-dwelling ascetics. Their worship of images was on the fringe of mainstream Vedic religious practices which revolved around fire sacrifice. With the Vishnu Dharmottara, they sought to incorporate and even subsume Vedic ideas into the worship of Vishnu as a supreme being. Central to their faith was the annual five night or Pancharatra celebration of the sleep and awakening of Vishnu before and after the monsoon. In their view, this had to be performed both by a kingdom's householders and by its ruler for it to be blessed by Vishnu. To convince their readers, they wove in their ideas into a grand narrative in the Vishnu Dharmottara Purana, where the sage Markandeya teaches the king Vajra in the aftermath of the Mahabharata war. Strikingly, the Vishnu Dharmottara used constructions of history and parallels to its contemporary reality to legitimize itself. This is similar to how modern political religious narratives are justified. At the end of its first book, Markandeya narrates a slightly modified version of the Ramayana to King Vajra. Vajra is told that after the coronation of the god king Rama, the unruly Gandharvas, who were immortal beings who ruled in mythical Gandhara, raided the western bank of the Jhelum, where Rama's Koma, the KK, was from. Rama dispatched his brother Bharata, who defeated the Gandharvas and celebrated the sleep and awakening of Vishnu in Gandhara. He then founded the cities of Pushkaravati and Takshashila for his sons Pushkara and Taksha and returned home. Now, the Vishnu Dharmottara is at pains to explain that Bharata, like his brother Rama, was an emanation of Vishnu. Now, all this might seem like inconsequential, nonsensical myth, but it's not. Just a few decades prior to the composition of the Vishnu Dharmottara, the Kashmiris had conquered the western bank of the Jhelum, as well as Takshashila in real world Gandhara from the Kabul Shahs. And the reigning king of Kashmir, to whom the Vishnu Dharmottara was presented, was named Vajraditya Chandrapida. As Indian argues, what the Vishnu Dharmottara seems to be saying is this. The Pancharatra rituals were instituted by an emanation of Vishnu after a conquest of Gandhara in distant antiquity and taught by a sage to a king Vajra. Should not King Vajraditya follow in their footsteps? It's very much possible that Vajraditya had already incorporated Pancharatra ideals into the organization of his court. In fact, his teacher Mehradatta, a Pancharatra master, may have been responsible for much of the Vishnu Dharmottara's composition, but not solely. 
Puranas such as this were composed and expanded across generations. The Gandhara story above suggests that they were made by what we could call complex agents. Royal courts also played a huge role, directly or indirectly, in shaping them. Vajrayatya's ministers, courtiers, and landed elites may have already been Pancharatra initiates. Their discussions with their teachers and the order's internal discussions and politics all played a role in how the Purana evolved. The second and third books of the Purana hint at this strongly. The second book, after narrating stories of legendary Kashmiri heroes granted powers by Vishnu, concludes the discussion of military tactics to be used to conquer the four quarters of the world. And the third book describes how the resulting king of kings is to place Pancharatra Vaishnavism at the heart of state ritual by constructing a colossal temple to Vaikuntha Vishnu, with four gateways for his four faces to look out into the four quarters of the subdued world. As it happens, Vajraditya Chandrapida's brother and successor, Lalitaditya Muktapida, had a career that corresponds closely to this sequence of events. Lalitaditya's ambitions were helped by the geopolitical chaos of his time. Rampaging through the Kathmandu and Kumaon valleys into the Gangetic plains, the newly emerged Tibetan Empire had sacked the older Vaishnava religious centers of Badrinath and Parayaga. Allying with the Chinese and the king of Kanauj, Lalitaditya forced the Tibetans into submission, comprising a conquest of the western quarter of his world. He then turned on his ally and took control of Kanauj, comprising a conquest of his south. According to the Rajatarangani of Kalahana, composed in Kashmir a few centuries later, Lalitaditya also forced the Cambodias to his east, who were probably the Turkshas, into submission, and routed the Tokharas, or the Tokharians, to his north. That's in Book 4, verses 165-168. Very much in line with the Vishnu Dharmotara, then this Pancharatra king of kings had conquered the four directions. Next, he built a great new imperial city at the confluence of the Jhelum and the Indus rivers, Parihasapura, probably intended as a new Prayaga since the old one had been sacked by Tibetans. Here, he built no less than three colossal temples to Pancharatra forms of Vishnu and a towering victory pillar surmounted by an eagle. At least two of these temples, notes Indan, appear to have been larger than the other large temple of Laitatya that remains standing in Kashmir, the Temple of the Sun at Martan. Now, I don't know if you've been to the Martan Sun Temple, but it's colossal, and to imagine temples bigger than that is pretty mind-blowing. On a lower plateau of Parihasapura were Buddhist stupas, one of them commissioned by Laitatya's Buddhist Turk minister, signifying the final subordination of Kashmir's ancient Buddhism to a triumphant imperial Vaishnavism. Briefly and brilliantly, the Pancharatrins and the Karkotas of Kashmir had seized the subcontinent center stage, religion supporting the state, state supporting religion. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can reach me on Instagram at Anirbuddha and at Connected Histories and on Twitter at Ekanisati. We'll see you next week.